Everything is a fraud except for Bitcoin. We are living in the information age and it's about time for a lot of people to wake up to that fact. No wonder that our whole society is filled with fraud from the individual level to the governmental level. You can always feel the shoe on your face, you know, like bam, bam, bam. It would make sense to use a fiat currency like euro or dollars and back it with Bitcoin. That's why some finance experts become very emotional and because Bitcoin is a paradigm shift. The more money they print from now on, the higher the price of Bitcoin is going to get and will take away this, this power and give it to critical thinkers like you and me and other Bitcoiners. They just uh, were able to shut your bank account down and this made a lot of people be quiet. They saw what happened to other people who spoke up and they'd be like, I don't want to have anything to do with it. So they were like, I'm just going along. It's okay. And I understand that because it was really scary and it's still not over. What do you prefer? Trust of a system that's corrupt, obviously, which can be proven? Or do you want to use technology that is provably the truth? Truth. I knew this is good and I knew this is a punch in the face of people who are corrupt. What's the initial spark that you had with, with the book? Like, why did you write the book? Um, so I'm originally a singer and a music producer and um, along came the pandemic and kind of changed everything. And I was kind of shocked about uh, how the politics uh, and changed uh, the general rules of life for everybody and even even more that most people just went along with it even though it was uh, partially very very confusing and uh, obviously uh, wrong and um, uh, suddenly I you know normally you sit down as a music producer and you'll be like okay let's start a new song let's start a new track and then you sit down on the piano and you play something and you get inspired and then you know one thing uh, comes to the next and you have a finished product right and uh, during that time, I was like, I was sitting down and I was like, uh, uh, and somehow it, I wasn't inspired anymore. And um, there's the story about the, the guy who, um, who was experimenting with dogs and uh, in Russia, it's uh, Ivan Pavlov. And um, so he, he put a, a glass on the mouth of the dogs and then he gave them food. And then he measured the amount of uh, spy, a spit that flowed into the glass, right? And uh, after a while, he gave them food and he rang a bell and the dogs had a lot of spit, you know, and then he only had the, be the bell, but no food. But the dogs still were, you know, uh, I don't know the English word for zaban, but, you know, it was still flowing, although there was no food, but they connected the bell to the food, right? So, um, and then there was a, a flood and the... Um, the labor where he was working, where the dogs were uh, experimenting with, um, got flooded and a lot of them died, but some were rescued. And then he found them and he rang the bell again. And this time they didn't, uh, there was no spit, you know? And uh, because they, they were so shocked that something in their brain got messed up and rewired. And um, I think that's something along that way kind of happened to me and then i was uh, you know i had this idea uh, to to you know write a book or to you know to uh, put a spotlight on the fraudulent world that we are living in um, because i also think it's kind of entertaining uh, if you're not directly involved with it and uh, and then suddenly came the, uh, the idea to write a book and then i you know woke up in the morning and i opened the laptop and i started writing and I didn't uh, look at the clock until 2 p.m. And I, wasn't, I didn't even have breakfast, right? And so uh, the, the creativity that I, I had for the music, for music reduction, kind of switched to, um, to writing. I don't know why, because I'm dyslexic, actually, but uh, it happened. And so and when I start something, I try to you know, pull through and finish it. And... Um, try to bring it to success and that's um yeah that's what so two weeks ago the book came out in german you know and uh yeah and then yesterday uh we met at the btc in prague so uh, and now i have to you know go to podcasts and talk about it so people will recognize it and hopefully buy it <laughs> I, it, it's a, it's a, it will be a great uh, success, I think. So it's a topic is really interesting. But before we come to the to the podcast, I have uh, to the the book, I have one more question. Um, 
I just thought about that like, when you when you write songs, it's also like you're writing text to all of like you can even make an argument that you write like a small story uh, with like a melody and stuff like that. Uh, how how did this help you like in, in in writing a book? Was it is it similar than that? I think so. Yes. Um, so you have to, and uh, if you write a song, you have to um, you know start at the beginning and then you make it interesting, 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 and then you finish it. And the finishing and the beginning are somehow connected, you know. So it makes all sense and it keeps you glued to the to the content of the song. Um, and even if you don't have lyrics, you know, still the music that you produce, because my music is mostly like for TV shows and uh, advertisings, um, you still need to keep it interesting, right? And uh, I think it's a very similar um, process if you write a book. You have to, you know, hook the people and then you have to keep them entertained and keep them moving and you have to keep a red line that goes through the whole book. And I hope that I achieved that and, um, you know, bring content to the people that, because most people are like Bitcoin. I mean, like, yeah, it's uh, it's digital money, whatever, you know, it's cryptographic. Most people are like, I don't know, I don't care. And my book has a completely different angle. It's, uh, you know, it puts a spotlight on how fraudulent the world is from the individual level to the um, level of governments and um, how Bitcoin could change this to, uh, to a better world. And I think this is a new portal for people who are kind of interested in Bitcoin, but, you know, they are not very technical and who prefer a good story, you know, um, maybe that's a, that's a book for them. So, um, yeah. And I uh, now took the German title and just like translated it to like everything is a scam except Bitcoin. Is, is would you to go with that kind of a translation? Yeah, I, I'm not sure if uh, fraud or scam is the uh, right word, but everything is a fraud except for Bitcoin would be a sufficient title. I hope nobody is going to steal this now, you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, exactly. Everything is a fraud except for Bitcoin. And uh, if you want, I can explain uh, how how this idea came up. Mm. Uh, yes, definitely. And and uh, like, how did this idea came up? And and then maybe like, uh, let's because I think uh, really important is for us to define what's fraud. I feel like in especially in the internet days, uh, it, it's so it's so easy to say like, oh, you're a fraud. Oh, this is a fraud. Uh, and it's like, but how do you define fraud? Like. Uh, it's like I even get comments like, "Oh, Bitcoin is a fraud." Like I, I hear hear that in the comments quite regular. Like every two weeks, I get one kind of a comment like that, and I always like don't don't hate them. I just like ask like, "Oh, how do you define fraud, and how does this connect to Bitcoin?" And usually, there's no answer to that. <laughs> like m most people that say like, "Oh, that's a fraud," don't even have an answer or definition of a fraud. But uh, first, let's go to um, uh, what you said. How you came up with the idea? Um, so I think a fraud is uh, if you uh, try to project a reality reality to someone that doesn't exist, okay? And um, Bitcoin is not a fraud, it's a technology. It's a real thing, it's information. And we are living in the information age and it's uh, about time for a lot of people to wake up to that fact. You know, because uh, you have Facebook, you have uh, other digital companies, They are, they are purely digital. Okay, they have their servers and stuff, you know, but in the end, it's just information and they get a lot of money with that. I mean, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, the, the guys from Google, right? They are, they have become billionaires. And because information is a, is a form of energy too. Okay. And um, I explain that in my book a little bit deeper um, you know, when I go through the history of how, how money developed and, um, so how do you define a fraud? It's, you know, you, 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 you protect or you um, make a reality up that doesn't exist. And in that, during that process, you steal the monetary energy of someone. That's mainly what I think fraud is, you know? So, and if people believe that Bitcoin is a fraud, it's because they, you know, didn't buy it early enough and now they don't want to buy it because they think it's a Ponzi scheme, which is, obviously not true because you know the price of bitcoin is defined by demand and uh what's the other word angebot and nachfrage supply <laughs> supply and demand right so um you know it's 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 not a ponzi scheme it's something completely different 
And um, yeah, so. And how did you come up with, with the whole idea of the book? Um, so I, at first I had a, uh, another idea to say, there's one more thing. And uh, then I would, you know, make a short video about the fraud that just happened. You know, because the frauds happen all the time. If it's bank fraud, if it's fraud on the individual level, you know, every day you open up the news and you see another fraud, another Ponzi scheme or whatever, you know. And my idea was to, you know, do a regular short just about uh, the frauds. And, but somehow uh, then the idea for the book developed and um, everything is a fraud except for Bitcoin. The reason for that is that every person can be good and evil. You know, every person is good and evil. And one factor that uh, makes you more evil in the sense of the fraud that you, you know, steal the monetary energy of someone else is um, that you get opportunities. Okay, so people who get opportunities um, tend to, even if they are a very good person, tend to use the opportunity to gain a monetary benefit against other people. In my book, I use the example of a, a guy who is working at DHL and he brings you a package with a camera that you bought but you are not at home. So uh, he just puts the camera in front of your door. It's, you know, normally he has to get a signature, he doesn't. He's just like putting it in front of the door. You come home and you are a good person, but now there's an opportunity for you. You know, you take the, you take the package with the camera, you go inside and then you call them and say, where's the package? And then they say, well, we delivered it. And then you say, well, I didn't get it. Where is it? Prove it to me. And they can't prove it because they didn't get the signature from you. And so you will get the money back from an insurance, right? You're a smart guy. You made, uh, you know, you, you just got a camera for free, which is kind of expensive for 1,200 euros. That's a smart move. You know, that's kind of evil. You know, I mean, not evil, but it's, uh, you know, some, you get an opportunity and you do something bad. And then you look at the financial system that we have, which is governed by politicians who, you know, tend to use, who are kind of the sort of people who use uh, opportunities more often than others, you know, that's why they get this job. And, uh, you know, the, the fiat monetary system where you can just, uh, you know, take, uh, take credits, you know, like the governments do. I mean, they, they, sell, um, they sell bonds and take in money and that's the ultimate opportunity. They can just print money out of thin air. And that's the ultimate opportunity. So no wonder that our whole society is, you know, uh, filled with fraud from the individual level to the governmental level. And I believe that if you, you know, take away the um, part with the opportunities in the monetary system, you can change the world in many, many good ways. Um, and everybody is going to win from it. So, you know, everything is a scam except for Bitcoin because Bitcoin offers no opportunities. It's the same rules for everybody around the world. Is, is uh, for you inflation and money printing then like the, the, the fraud that's on the biggest scale? Exactly. Exactly. That's the point. You know, we act like it's uh, totally normal that we have 2% inflation, which is uh, also a lie. That's, it's not 2%. Like Lynn Alden proves in her book, it's more like 6.5% per year, you know. And uh, it's, it's, like a, it's like a hidden tax. You don't get to vote for it. You know, it's like they, they just take it from you. And it's, it's like legalized theft. You know, why don't we have a monetary system with 0% inflation? Because the government loves inflation, because inflation makes their debt burden be become less and less. Because, you know, you have the cap capacity, everybody has a battery, you know, with the positive part and the negative part. Like I can have a bank account with uh, 5,000 euros on it and I can have a credit card at the same time with minus 2,000 euro on it. And then you expand the monetary supply. The battery gets larger, but the amount of money stays the same. So in, if I have uh, uh, like a minus, minus uh, 2,000 euros and the monetary, uh, you know, the, the capacity of the battery gets expanded, it's in, uh, in relation, it's less now. And that's what governments love. And that's why real estate investments in combination with the credit is also a very smart way to become 
you know, wealthy because you use the same, you know, you use inflation as uh, wind to sail. And if you save money on your bank account, you have the same wind, but it blows in your face. And you get, you don't get anything. Even if you get like 4%, 5% of interest from, from the bank where you put your money, you know, it's, you don't get anything because the government takes it away from you and gives it to people who have real estate and to the government itself because they reduce the debt. I, I love the example with, with the wind and uh, for like, for some people, they profit from that and then sail with the inflation and uh, the good people that like just want to do what's what's right they don't know better they're saving in euros they're saving in dollars and they're like uh, oh i'm saving on my bank account and that's the only thing they are doing because uh, they don't think that they're good enough for like having real estate having stocks having all those those assets they don't want to get in debt which is a good thing like basically like if you don't want to get in debt you have a good mindset but it's in the, you're in the wrong system for that. You have to be in the Bitcoin system and not in the fiat system. Because if you're in the fiat system and you want to save and you don't want to use the debt system, you actually get screwed all the time. So then you're, the wind that actually should enhance you because you're a good person actually blows in your face. And the, the bad person that actually uses that to their advantage, they get the, the advantage from that. It's, it's, I love that example a, a lot. Exactly. Um, the, the only question that I have with that is like, why don't they notice their wind in their face? Like why, why they don't just like turn around and, and use the wind with Bitcoin? Uh, and and is, is the pain still not high enough? Because it's a fraud and they get a reality that isn't there and they believe that reality. And, um, you know, people know it, people feel it, but it's it's not very obvious. That's why it's a fraud. You know, it's not very obvious because uh, the, the technology advantage that we have you know technology is uh, making everything cheaper so you know you don't feel the the amount of inflation that uh, and the amount of money printing that the government is using you don't feel it that much but it's kind of there you know and um so people really um have to you know uh, learn about it and most people don't because they are too busy you know the, the inflation kind of thing they take away money from you and you, you kind of feel it, but you don't know where it's coming from. But you always feel the shoe on your face, you know, like bam, bam, bam. And you, you try, try to swim and nobody's, you know, you try to swim, stay above the water and just, you know, get the, get the air. You try to get the next job. You try to save money here. And in the meantime, someone is trying to push you down. And then you don't have, you are too busy swimming and staying above the waterline then you don't have time to think about inflation and think about the guy who's putting the shoe on you to push you down the water, you know? So I don't know if and some, some people won't notice it, and, but hopefully we can uh, wake some people up. And in the meantime, people are angry. You know, I love the, the Klaus Schwab thing, you know? We both are German speakers, you know, and I think we do a much better job than Klaus Schwab, but he's like, people will be very angry it's an angry world. We have to prepare for this world. And why are people angry? Because they are so busy, you know, not drowning. And then they are angry at each other and not at the guy who's putting the shoe on their, on their neck. Do, do you think that, that, that fraud will, uh, continue? Like I, I have a, the more I'm in Bitcoin, the more bullish I get about Bitcoin. But the more I also understand what strong network effect that fiat system has, like the, the people are so embedded in the system and even young people with 15, 16 years old, even a lot of them are really embedded already in that fiat system because they get it from their parents, they get it from the media, they get it from everyone. So it's such a big fraud. Um, and it's so embedded in the system that even like a lot of people that work for that fraud, they think it's a good thing. Uh, it's like, uh, I don't know how many people actually in the fiat system, they work for the fiat system, they work for, maybe for a bank, they work for a central bank, even recognized. Like, I, I don't think that most people are evil. I think they're just, they're, the system grew over time and now they're working there and they don't even realize uh, what uh, um, major evil things they're doing. Um, is how, how do we get rid of, like, is, is Bitcoin actually getting rid of that fiat system? Do we have a chance of, uh, 
enrooting that and, and, and putting an end to, to that major fraud? Or is, is that always, uh, is government issued money uh, always a thing? Or maybe can it be backed with Bitcoin? So I think opportunity makes the theft. And um, people who believe that uh, the fiat monetary system is a good thing um, believe in the government and the government is not corrupt, you know, which is obviously very naive because uh, the government is also only, uh, uh, you know, a team of people and people are tend to use the opportunity that's offered to them. And, you know, the more power you get, the more corrupt you get. It's a, a famous quote. I don't know exactly the words, but... You know, everybody knows it, uh, you know, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, you know. Yeah, and so um, people who believe that the fiat system has also benefits for society, you know, because I heard the argument that the debt of the government that gets reduced when you uh, expand the capacity of the battery, you know, we all win from it because we are all the government. Isn't that great? We all profit from it. Well, yeah. Um, so in my opinion, uh, I think Bitcoin can also be a chance for the fiat monetary system to, you know, live a little bit longer. Um, and I think a great future would be um, because the problem with Bitcoin is it's a good problem. Listen to me. Bitcoin is capped at 21 million. OK. And the technology advantage of the world is getting faster and faster the available, usable, and monetizable energy that we use as a world society is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And therefore, the price of Bitcoin is going to rise ever and ever and ever. And you have to have one thing if you want a stable currency. You need a stability. And Bitcoin doesn't have that because it's going up forever. Okay? And um, so, in my opinion, what would make sense until we are all so rich that money doesn't matter anymore, which is also possible. It would make sense to use a fiat currency like euro or dollars uh, and back it with Bitcoin. And I would like to see that on, uh, on the Lightning Network. I don't know. I heard someone say that it already exists, but I didn't discover it yet. But I think that uh, could be uh, a future. So we have a stable uh, unit of account and you have, but you have the uh, total limit of um, uh, amount of Bitcoin that exists and it can save endless amounts of monetary energy, which is remarkable. <laughs> um, which for me is also the book really interesting because you have to, to basically make two messages clear, like why everything is a, a, a fraud. And the other thing is like, uh, why Bitcoin is not and why Bitcoin is great. What was the more like with what did you struggle more explaining is it is bitcoin a, is, is it harder to wake up people to the fraud or is it easier to like or is it harder to to explain bitcoin to people um i tried to explain the society first that we are living in because it's uh, sometimes really hard to you know i i feel like we live in a in an age of information warfare you know and uh, most people are not able to take the time because the guy is standing on their shoulders and they are kind of drowning. But most people don't have the time to go and watch a hearing in the United States, you know, because it's all streamed. You can watch the whole thing, but they don't have the time for that. So they take the news article they get about it, which is just a derivative of that. And they, they, they read it and they'd be like, ah, okay, now I'm informed. Now I know what happens. And they start to build their reality upon that. Okay. And, um, the problem is that this news article is not, it's not fair. It's not, you know, um, it, it, it contains a reality that someone else wants to present to you and you feel you, you don't recognize that. So you start to build your own reality, um, with, uh, with these blocks of information that you receive from other people, not directly from the source. And, um, you know, it, it's very hard to, make people understand that they build a, re a reality because it becomes part of their identity. And if you say to them things that are actually true, but they have different information, they kind of get emotional. You know, if, if someone tells me something about, I don't know, <clears throat> that really shakes my, um, shakes my reality, then I might also get very emotional. And, um, 
you know, the fiat, fiat money is also some kind of religion, you know, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's part of your identity. And that's why some experts, finance experts become, uh, very emotional when, when, because Bitcoin is like a paradigm shift and they are entrenched in this fiat world and they know exactly what's going on. And now they really, it's, it's part of their identity. And now they, they see this new thing and they'd be like, no, that's impossible. You know, this is my identity. I can't change. It's very, you know, the hardest thing a human can do is to change. You know, do you think that, I mean, I, I love to be on your podcast. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But do you think that, you know, I wrote the book and I have to do this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to be here, you know, but I have to do it because nobody else is going to do it. And I love Bitcoin too much to not do it. And, um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, I, I, I love it a lot. And, but it seems a lot like, um, when we go to, uh, critical thinking, like, I feel like we have a critical thinking crisis. We have to like mm -hmm. really, um, start critical thinking again. Um, is, is it possible that with Bitcoin, nothing really changed because, um, there are a few select people that actually think critical about everything and they are awakened and they, they see it and they will benefit from it, but the masses are asleep and they will get into like some other fiat fraud that someone's been up. Is, is, is that some, some possibility for you? No, impossible because, um, the more you manipulate, you know, If you get paid from someone who says that, I don't know, the climate change is caused by CO2, you, your whole life depends on it. And you do the studies and you get all the money from them. Where do they get the money from? They get it from the money printer, mostly. They get it from this corrupt system. And the more money they print from now on, the higher the price of Bitcoin is going to get. And we'll take away this, this power and give it to critical thinkers like you and me and other Bitcoiners. You know, who try, it's, it's very difficult, but who try to see the world as it is, who try to make critical thinking and, uh, you know, are not, um, so, um, deceptible for this, this kind of, um, corruption, you know, that's going, that's going on in the society. Bitcoin is taking away this power to corrupt the society and, you know, make, create realities that are debatable. Right. Thank you. You already made it halfway through the video and I'm really, really grateful to have you here. Two things make this channel possible. You as a watcher and listener who keep supporting this channel. And another one is all the Bitcoin brands that I partner up with, like 21 Bitcoin, who support me from the very start and where I personally buy my Bitcoin from. With Code Robin, you even get a discount when you buy Bitcoin with them. And now also Bitbox. Bitbox is the simplest and securest way to secure your Bitcoin. And I heard a crazy statistics. Only 2% of Bitcoiners hold their Bitcoin in a hardware wallet. How crazy is that? Don't be in that 98% bracket. Be in the 2% bracket. And if you have self-custody and you know your friend does not have, maybe he needs a Christmas present. Maybe he needs a birthday present. And a small life hack, if you use code ROBIN, you get 5% off your order plus you support my channel. And uh, now let's get back to the video. <laughs> and, 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 for, and for you, you described it, I think, in the beginning, uh, for you, uh, 2020, like the, uh, the, the pandemic was for you the, the wake up moment, right? So, so did you have before this, this feared mindset with like inflation is good, the government is good, and, or did you were already critical before the 2020 crisis? I wouldn't say that I was that critical. I already knew that inflation had, uh, you know, had its certain rules and, I tried to, you know, uh, become a, a real estate uh, guy, you know, which is not, uh, which is not easy because it's very expensive in the beginning. Um, but actually it started a little bit earlier. I mean, everybody knows 9-11 was a little bit, uh, you know, that it, it's kind of on shaky ground. The, all the information that we get about it is kind of, uh, I don't know if it's really a hundred percent true what the government says about it. Maybe it's, You know, something else also happened. And, um, and then I was watching the hearings, uh, from, uh, from, uh, Donald Trump's, um, you know, Robert Mueller, the Robert Mueller hearings. And I was watching the whole thing because I was interested in how corrupt Donald Trump is, you know, and 
the more I watched it, the more confused I got. And then I was, uh, you know, reading the newspaper in Germany or watching the news, and they said something that has had nothing to do with what I experienced when I was listening to these hearings. You know, I don't want to say Trump is good or bad or whatever, you know, I don't care, actually. But uh, I just noticed this information kind of thing that was going on. And then during the pandemic, they had, you know, the money printing. Of course, I was, it was like, okay, this, they are going to print a lot of money because they think it's the solution to, to everything. And, um, yeah, and then the whole, um, you know, injection kind of thing. And at first I also thought maybe it's a good idea to, you know, get these injections. Uh, you know, why not? Maybe I can help others with that and stuff. All this propaganda that they put out in that time. And the more I waited, um, the less I wanted to get the shot, right? Because I was like, why are politicians pushing people so hard to get these injections? It's kind of weird, man. And it kind of, you know, threw me back. And... And then more and more information came out about especially the corruption of the, you know, pharma industry, which is also a big part of my book. And my test readers were like, well, you should do this part a little bit shorter because it's so corrupt. And I had such a long, uh, you know, capital about it, chapter, and uh, I really shortened it down to, uh, to a good level. But, um, you know, the companies uh, that sold us this injection uh, actually sold also different products before that, long before that, of which they knew, and it was proven, and they paid for that. It was proven that they knew that they were killing their customers with it, okay? And, uh, you know, it's also um, um, very, very frightening, kind of. And I think this whole um, power that they were pushing so much is because they have the power over the money printer, uh, money printer. and I think maybe it was peak. It was peak fiat. And now we are, you know, th this whole thing woke up a lot of people. And some people made found their way into the Bitcoin rabbit hole, which is awesome. Um, but other people also just got a lot more skeptical about everything that, you know, comes from, <laughs> from the side of the governments and are wondering if they lied to, about, to us about this, which is very important, you know important and life-changing for a lot of people, you know, shutting down businesses and, you know, forcing masks on children, even though they knew that masks don't really have, a, you know, any use case. Um, you know, that really shook up a lot of people. And um, I think once, they, once more people fall into the Bitcoin rabbit hole, this will change uh, the world dramatically because the world is made up of individuals. And Bitcoin gives you a lot more control over your own life because if you spoke out against the pandemic uh, politic politics, you know, they just uh, were able to shut your bank account down. And then you were like, okay. And, and this made a lot of people be quiet, you know. It's like they saw what happened to other people who spoke up and they'd be like, I don't want to. I don't want you to have anything to do with it, you know. So they were like, I'm just going along. It's okay. And I understand that because it was really scary and it's still not over. And I, I think this whole pandemic... Uh, subject is not a part of my book because it's all still very open and not uh, not sufficiently um, discussed in society yet. It will take uh, some more years to, uh, you know, so we come out at the other side and still have a democracy, still have a working society. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah. Do you, do you think we have now uh, a working society and a working democracy? Uh, yes, but it's on the edge, I would say, you know, I think which is interesting is uh, we are on the side of the decentralized world and YouTube and Meta, also Instagram and, uh, and they are on the side of the centralized world, but we still have to use them to get more people on the other side. And, you know, once people are know that they have their Bitcoin on their own wallet and they can leave the country and at any time they will be able to speak out against corruption and uh, you know they will have more um, braveness they will be braver because they are free and the government hates that they hate it but they can't stop it and which is so nice to see it in, Amer in America how uh, you know Bitcoin becomes such a political uh, subject that 
Donald Trump embraces Bitcoin and is like, let's mine all the remaining Bitcoin in America, which is also nonsense, but you know, that's a typical Trump uh, sentence. And now Joe Biden comes along, or Joe Biden and his handlers, uh, you know, uh, comes along and uh, says, yeah, maybe we should also accept cryptocurrencies as donations, you know, and they, they will have a meeting now with the Bitcoin miners and, you know, it's... Um, It's, it's a wave that they cannot stop anymore. And it's, it's the peaceful revolution from a decentralized system against a centralized system, which is corrupt. It's fascinating for me how this whole thing shakes out because America already has it as, an, uh, as a topic. And EU election, I follow some of the debates because I was curious what topics they are discussing. I was really not curious about what they are saying to the topics, but I was really curious like, What are they discussing? Mm -hmm. And there was no talk of like, how can we stop inflation? There was no talk of like, uh, how can we uh, embrace cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, like no nothing even close to that. I would be like, if someone said the word crypto, I would be really satisfied, honestly. And I'm like a Bitcoin. I don't want to hear crypto too much. I only want to hear Bitcoin. Uh, but if a politician says like crypto, then he is like a little bit closer <laughs> to, to, to that. And nobody, like one guy said once in Austria, uh, oh, we have to return to, to hard money. And he was not referring to Bitcoin, not referring to gold. He was referring to the old fiat currency we used before in Austria, which was better than the euro. But <laughs> not, this was not a, hard, not a real hard currency like gold or Bitcoin. Mm. Yeah. So that's that's uh, that's un very it was very sad for me in the European election uh, that the topics were just like not not on target. It was not an, an, at least a little bit of a topic. Bitcoin should have been uh, mm. as it is in America. It doesn't have to be the main one. I understand that in politics right now, war in Ukraine is a big one. Uh, it's not that big for for myself. Uh, but uh, a lot of people actually have concerns and yeah, politics should address it. It should be one topic, but it should not be the only topic. So um, um, it's interesting for me. How do you see actually like uh, game theory right now playing out when we have America seemingly, seemingly actually again, leading the way European is like, there's this, uh, this, this nice line, like America innovates, China copies, and then European uh, Union tries to regulate everything. <laughs> Uh, it seems to uh, happen also again with Bitcoin. How do you see it uh, with the game theory? It's the typical roles. I mean, the United States of America is always like five to ten years ahead of everybody else uh, when it comes to technology and uh, things like that. Yeah, and I mean, you nailed it. You know, the Europeans love to regulate it and the Chinese people love to ban it, you know, and then uh, they have to embrace it anyways, which they also do. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert in game theory, um, but it's kind of obvious that it seems to play out right now in front of our eyes. And still people are kind of um, doubting Bitcoin. It's so funny, you know, I have uh, uh, friends who really, you know, they, they, are, they don't want to own Bitcoin, not even a little bit because they still don't trust it. And then you have about people like, uh, you know, uh, um, Larry Fink from BlackRock, who says Bitcoin is digital gold, right? And, um, and gold has a market cap of 15 billion and Bitcoin has a market cap of 1.5 billion. So if Bitcoin is digital gold, it must be at least as good as the, uh, the old kind of gold, right? So it should do a 10x from here. But they, you know, they, they still, I don't know, they still don't, uh, are not open to that. Um, but at some point they will have to understand it. And, you know, if now the game theory plays out and at some point I know they will maybe ask me about it, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, in the last part of the podcast, I really want to dive a little bit also in, in the writing process in there. Uh, what, was it your first book that you wrote? Yes, uh, so I'm actually dyslexic and um, uh, I don't know what happened, but, you know, I, um, I, I just started writing. I've, at first I did a mind map. I used uh, Miro.com, I think it is. And then I was just like, diving into the subject, what's the, what's, what ideas do I have? You know, what, what's the line, which combinations are there? 
And, um, and then I knew that I had to start with problems, first of all, and then uh, you, uh, you do the solution in the end of the book. That's, uh, you know, that's very important if you want to, um, if you write a book and you would put the solution in the beginning and the problems in the end, then nobody's going to read it because, you know, I don't know, because they, they don't want to read about the solution. They want at first to read about the problems. Okay. Um, and this I learned from Hermann Scherer, it's a German uh, speaker. He's a very nice, uh, inspirational guy. And, um, well, I don't know, it's like the, the process of writing. I just started and I, um, and, and during the process, uh, some things changed because I, I was starting with frauds from the individual level to the governmental level. And then I wanted to pinpoint uh, to inflation as the biggest, biggest fraud of all of them. But then I switched it and I put a chapter to explain banks, how fraudulent banks are. And then I explained in, in the combination Bitcoin. You know, banks are the, uh, the business of um, trust and Bitcoin is the technology of truth. You know, what, what do you prefer? Trust of a system that's corrupt, obviously, which, which can be proven. Or do you want to use technology that is provably the truth? Because, you know, every 10 minutes you create a block and it's a blockchain that cannot be changed. It's, it's the truth. It's information. Um, and then after that, I started uh, with, with inflation. So, during the writing process, some things changed, you know, but, uh, yeah, so that was uh, the process. And at some point I also was like, oh man, this is too much for me. I, I think I can't, can't do it. And then I, I kind of, uh, you know, I also wrote like 40 pages that I completely threw out during the process. I was like, I don't know, it kind of doesn't fit in. Uh, maybe it's a little bit too conspiratorial conspiratorial you know and um, I just threw it out and um, yeah but I, I kind of made it over the hump and um, and and then I was like the the straight line I just I just knew I had to finish the to the line and I knew I can make it and then I was yeah really happy I wrote nine months and then I uh, went to Twitter and uh, said, hey, I, guys, I wrote a book. Who wants to test read it? Because if you write a book, it's most important that you find test readers. Because the feedback you get is very valuable. And um, as I told you, I just really had to, you know, put half of the pharma uh, chapter out. Because people said it's too long. Okay. And... Um, so it's very valuable to find test readers. And, um, and then I had to like six months of additional work to, you know, I had to, I don't know how it's, how it's called in English, but lectorat and correctorat. So the, someone who reads everything is a professional and says, uh, well, you should change the sentence to this and maybe you should use a different word here. And then the correctorat is like uh, putting all the um, words in correct writing uh, and all the you know quotes and stuff and yeah and then you have to do the inner design of the book it's also an, uh, an additional process <sighs> you know and the cover design <laughs> it's so much work but um and then but i think it's brilliant that nowadays anybody can write a book and you can um then publish it on your own uh, using different platforms like bod it's from amazon uh no KDP is from Amazon and then uh, there's BOD, Books on Demand, and it works like uh, print on demand. So if you order my book, uh, they print it ex especially just for you. So there's no uh, storage of the books um, and it makes the process very lean and um, easy. And yeah, it's, uh, it's very nice. Yeah. What was there at some point uh, the point where you're like, ah, fuck it, I don't want to write this book because nine months, uh, it's like a very long process. And the book is interesting because you write very long. Uh, and then in the end, you you never know, like, do even people like, do even people read it? Uh, so it's like a, a, a very, very, a lot of hours where you never get feedback. For me, for the podcast, I just started out, put the first podcast episode out. So I get constantly feedback. Oh, that's good. That's bad. Mm -hmm. So it's like I, I write a long book with podcasts, like kind of like reading, like writing a book. Uh, and I always get feedback. And from that, I can really like 
every hour, every five hours, uh, put in a, in a podcast episode because on average for one podcast episode, I need five hours. So put like five hours of work out there. Then I get feedback. How did people like that podcast episode? And for the next uh, podcast episode, I can even like in ingrain that feedback already. But a book is a little bit different. Of course, you could like also release an articles on one a specific chapter and then release like the book in, 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 in steps. Uh, a friend of mine, Daniel White actually do, does it like that. He's Good. now writing a book in real time on medium and writing chapter after chapter and also like rewriting. And he gets a lot of feedback from the community for that. It's an interesting uh, concept to write a book like that. Uh, but was there ever a point where we were like, ah, it's, I don't know, like nine months, it's, it's too long. Uh, let's, let's throw it away. Uh, when I started to do this, I didn't know how much time it will take me. And, um, but during the process, I also knew that this is going to be a good, good book. I knew it. And, um, I think the feedback from the uh, test readers was very, um, positive and, uh, and, but they also gave feedback that, so I could even increase the quality even more. And, um, but I don't know, man, you know, the, there's so much, I'm actually super angry, even though I appear to be very friendly, I hope, you know, but I'm super angry to be honest. And I, I put a lot of this anger into the book and it's a creative outlet for me. And I, I know that, and, and I knew during the writing, I knew this is good. And I knew this is a punch in the face of people who are corrupt. You know, and uh, hopefully it um, it's entertaining. Also, this is my my angle. I try to also entertain and try to you know put a joke in here and there. You know, to make fun of the uh, corrupt people in our society. Um, so yeah, um, I know. I you know I was like, I I knew that it was good, but at the point where I was, it was uh, like six months in, and then I was a little bit. Um, you know, maybe off, off, off the path. And I had too many roads that I could take. And, um, and that was a little bit, um, what was that? <laughs> and it was a little bit, uh, uh, you know, um, I had to decide which, which road I will take now. And, um, but once I decided it, it was, uh, it was a clear path forward. And yeah, I, I think it's a very it's an interesting way to, you know, write article, 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 or uh, chapter, 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 and, and then get feedback instantly. But also, I think if you, if, if you write a book, um, you try to, you know, create a bow from the beginning to the end. And during this process, you try to, you know, get the um, reader up to a new level of understanding. And this is what I love about books. And that's why I don't like, for example, uh, Blinkit, Blinkist, you know, this app where you get the whole content in 15 minute summary, because it's a derivative. It's, it's just like I told you about if you watch the hearing or if you read the newsletter about it. I mean, it's just, in Blinkist is just the information, okay, but you don't get in the connection and the humor of the uh, author who tries to open, open up your mind for a new understanding of a, a new view of the world. And um, so I think it's very hard for uh, test readers who read our chapter by chapter only and not the whole thing through to see this, uh, this, you know, bow of attention uh, that you try to create as the author of a book, right? So, but there are different kinds of books. So, you know, for example, Tools of uh, Titans, which we also uh, already talked about, it's not uh, that he, you know, he has a very clear format. But it's also only podcast interviews, um, and he just takes the most uh, valuable information from these podcast interviews. And you can read just one uh, podcast interview after another, but you don't have to read the whole thing through. You know, you can also just skip some chapters, and it's a different kind of a book. Um, you know, maybe your friend is working on a on a book like that, and uh, then it makes a lot of sense to get uh, you know the direct feedback from uh, people. Yeah. yeah, that would be also interesting because yeah, we talked about that because I'm in the process of also of making the podcast. I think I told it on the podcast already like two, three times that I think of writing a book. I'm like coming closer and closer to that idea. I have like a big Google Docs document where I'm like 
trying to figure out how to do it. And I have like 20 different directions I can go through. And you actually made a really good um, suggestion to me to make a book about uh, Bitcoin, about my podcast, uh, similar than what uh, Tim Ferriss did. And I actually researched yesterday when I was on a train about uh, that book because I just didn't knew about it. Uh, mm. And I love that format. I will uh, do it a little bit different. I, I mm. think like I have some some things where I could do it differently. And I even thought about um, categorizing my podcast in different uh, categories because mm. sometimes we talk about self-custody, sometimes we talk about philosophy, something more about economics. So there are like different uh, things about it. And maybe I just like start with one thing and make a smaller book about that and make like my first book uh, around that topic. And maybe just like choose like 50 podcast episodes from that and make around that uh, one book about one topic uh, and give examples of that, uh, which yeah, I, I had a lot of thoughts about that. But yeah, I'm doing it really publicly. I'm, I'm talking with a lot of people about the book, uh, as I always do everything really publicly. So like if someone st steals my ideas, it's totally fine for me. <laughs> it's like I was also steal only for other people. And like I think the, the thought of like original thoughts, it's like you, you put you'd put two and three things together into your own thing. And that's called original thoughts. Like uh, the, uh, <laughs> there's always some quotes to that. So there's always somewhere where you got the idea from. Uh, so I'm doing it as always very transparency and very publicly. Uh, but I thought about uh, either making small articles uh, and then maybe put the whole thing in, in one book or like actually making smaller books around that. Uh, but yeah, at some point there will come, come book out of that. The only thing I'm really bad in writing, uh, but as you also said, like, uh, you also did not thought that you write a book and, and you have dyslexia is like, um, gives me a lot of hope that I might also be able to write a book <laughs> because I'm not that good in writing. I'm really bad actually. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm, uh, I'm happy to hear that it's, you know, maybe a little bit inspiring for you. Uh, to know about the book Tooth of Titans. I, I can also recommend it to everybody. It's a very a helpful book. Uh, you get a lot of advice from experts. Um, yeah, that's very nice. And also I offered you already, uh, if you need any uh, advice, um, I know a lot, uh, some things now <laughs> that could maybe uh, guide you a little bit. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, thank you uh, for, for, the, for the ideas. And uh, now coming closer to the end of the podcast, we're coming to this one hour mark where I'm usually getting aiming forward for a podcast episode. I think this is like, uh, it's like if you do every day a podcast, one hour, it's already a lot for, for people to consume. Uh, but one hour is an, always a great, uh, great, great uh, mark. Um, and the question that I always ask before the actual end routine is, what are you currently passionate about or deeply learning about, uh, which has nothing to do with Bitcoin? Um, currently I'm learning to do marketing and, uh, you know, for my book, uh, I'm actually, um, ich bin die ganze Zeit überfordert, würde ich auf Deutsch sagen. I would say, uh, like, how do you say that? I'm, um, you, you're I'm constantly, constantly overwhelmed with the, with the process it, of marketing. Yeah, exactly. Not only the marketing, the whole process. I was, I'm overwhelmed, uh, all the time. And I think that's a good thing because if you're not overwhelmed every day, you, with what you have to do during the day, I think you don't do enough process to, you know, get get somewhere, you know, because uh, it's a lot of work. And um, but I think what's also interesting currently to me and which I want to study a little bit more is uh, the Banner cycle. I don't know if you heard about it. Um, it's uh, Samuel Banner wrote a book about it and he analyzes uh, cycles of price uh, development. And the book is, I think, from 1790 something. It's very old the book. And Samuel Banner actually uh, lost a lot of money because he was a farmer and uh, he didn't understand why because his product was great. And then he studied price cycles and price developments. And, uh, you know, he, he created this price cycle uh, where you have to buy, where you have to sell and when panics appear. And um, interestingly... For example, the uh, 2000 crisis, he forecasted that. And also the big financial crisis, which is 2000 and 2008, right? So, and also I think 2020, he also predicted that there's something like a crash also. And, uh, which is kind of crazy, you know, it's a, it's a book. He, you can project, project this into the future because he focuses on, uh, uh, actually on, how the sun and how the planet, the, the earth is, you know, revolving around the sun. 
and that's how uh, that's why crops grow or don't grow as good and that's why prices are created because of uh, you know supply and demand and it's very interesting and i think i'm going to study this a little bit more if i have some time yeah i, I think uh, what you said in the beginning uh, i also feel like that sometimes i think when you don't feel overwhelmed you don't push hard enough like if you yeah. really want to grow and you really want to achieve something you constantly have to feel overwhelmed with it you constantly have to be in like a position where you even feel a little bit like an imposter you're like oh why am i'm that in in that position so uh if, if you don't have that you don't push hard enough uh and uh, it's like just let it, it's it's hard to uh, to enjoy the whole process of it uh and and i, I try to do that and then I, I i really enjoy uh, like maybe making the the interview with michael Sale and stuff like that but when you sit there and you actually hear him talking and you, he's just like one feet away from you and then he's he's that one guy that you always watched on tv and when you got orange bill and all of a sudden he speaks with you and you forget like oh Crazy, i'm the interviewer here uh that's like imposter syndrome uh times 10 uh <laughs> but but like i think if, if you don't have that you don't push hard enough and i'm really thankful and, and enjoy the, the the situation a lot i don't know if this is also the, the feeling that you described yeah exactly and uh it's also kind of honoring for me you know two days ago you interviewed michael sailor and now you interview me it's kind of you know it's very uh, humbling and uh you know uh, sometimes it's very important to not take yourself too seriously you know Uh, you have to stand. Most people stand in their own way. They they decide not to do an, something because they tell themselves, "I don't, I don't, I can't do that. I, you know, I'm not able to do this." And it's not true. Don't believe yourself. Don't take yourself too seriously. Take the phone and call someone and do the thing that you wanted to do. And you can only do something in combination with other people. If you like me, write a lot of good songs but never release them. Nothing's going to happen. Okay, so you have to work outside also and don't take yourself too seriously. Uh, very, very good. I think this is a good end uh, where we come to the podcast. And now we have the end routine uh, from the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest is. And the last guest asks you, uh, what are your current thoughts on the, the first half year of, of the Bitcoin ETF? Um, I think it's uh, it's uh, it opens the floodgates of uh, Wall Street and brings in new money into Bitcoin, which is great. And yeah, I don't um, you know the, the Grayscale uh, fund sold a lot of Bitcoin when while the BlackRock uh, fund bought a lot of Bitcoin and it kind of you know balanced itself out. So in 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 reality, I think only like. 100,000 or 200,000 Bitcoin actually uh, got bought in some, although BlackRock and, and the other ETFs bought like 800,000, you know, because uh, Grayscale sold so many. So that could also explain why the price isn't moving that much. But it's accumulation phase right now, and it's just a matter of time. And we are only seeing the beginning. Most people don't understand that um, Bitcoin is actually way too small for the big guys to put money in it. You know, they have to wait until Bitcoin has a market value like God of like 15 trillion. And then only then they can start to put money into it, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, but uh, it's it's going to be a lot of fun uh, during the next uh, maybe one or two years at least. And then we'll see. I think also the real floodgates, they, they really, uh, they, like they are, Start, slowly starting to open and the, the water is now slowly coming like this is just a just the beginning that we are seeing and the etf is in a fun topic because some really don't like it oh no it's institutional money and then i'm like yes but of course institutional money is coming in when it's the best for a saving place for financial energy uh perfect that then thank you dominic for for being on thank you for for taking the time uh before i let you go where can people find you and ask you questions I have to thank you, Robin, because uh, I'm actually not known anywhere. I think it's the first podcast I do. And even though I wrote a German book, I'm now on your podcast, which is uh, English speaking. Um, but thank you a lot. And if you want to find me, uh, you can go to allesbetrug.com and uh, also everywhere on, in, on the Internet. If you put in Alles Betrug, if you put it in small letters and in one word, Alles Betrug, that's how you find me. 
on Twitter and on Instagram and on YouTube everywhere. Perfect. I will uh, give the, the Twitter handle usually in, in the description and from there they can find uh, probably all the other links and find everything for, uh, from you. Then, yeah, thank you for being on and thank you uh, for everyone for watching. I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.